Museum. I'm glad that you're here for what I hope will be the first of many Dayton Literary Peace Prize talks here. Tonight's going to be a little bit different because it's the State of the Union night, and so um, these are still reporters. Our authors are still reporters, and so we're going to have them in conversation for an hour or so with uh, with Ernie Suggs, and then they've got to go watch the, uh, the president. So we're not going to have uh, time for questions tonight. You know, it's really fitting that it is here because from its inception, President Carter wanted this site to be focused on peace. And so when Kevin Riley talked to us, he's former editor of the AJC, when he called and asked me about hosting the, uh, the event tonight, I just jumped at the chance. And so did our bookstore partner, Acapella Books. Andrea Gillespie at the uh, James Weldon Johnson Institute, she said, yes, count me in. Uh, Julia Boyd with the uh, Press Club said yes. And a big thank you to Stacy Fox from the AJC uh, because they were helping us as well on this. This is an important discussion that we're gonna have here tonight. And to introduce our speakers is the executive director of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, Nick Raines. Well, good evening and thank you so much for spending some time with us here tonight to recognize these two incredible award-winning authors. They've told an incredible story, the story of a life that has captured the world. My name is Nick Raines. As Tony said, I'm the executive director of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation. You know, we say the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation. Some of you in here might be saying Dayton, like as in Dayton, Ohio. Yes, absolutely Dayton, Ohio. For nearly 20 years, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation has provided a platform for those who courageously say the truth. The Dayton Literary Peace Prize is the only award in the United States to combine a literature award with a peace award. And the writings of our honorees advance peace and lead readers to a better understanding of other cultures, peoples, religions, and political points of view. And so it was no surprise to us once all of the nominations had been made and once all of the reading had been done and the final judging done, uh, that we were able to present Robert and Tolu with the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Award for Nonfiction. Their joint work, His Name is George Floyd, didn't just capture our attention, but it also captured the attention of the good folks over at Pulitzer. And so it's easy to see why. This is a story that America needs to know. George Floyd was not just a headline. He was a person. A person who loved and who was loved. While he is most known for the murderous way in which his life ended, the full legacy of the life of George Floyd includes the struggles of his entire journey and the journey of those who came before him. From the fields of North Carolina to public housing in Houston, finding himself in and out of jail, aspirations of being a pro athlete. The story of George Floyd is in many ways the story of our nation. What a better temple of democracy to celebrate the telling of this story than the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. After being elected governor of Georgia for a second time, Carter told onlookers, the time for racial discrimination is over. No poor, rural, weak, or black person should ever have to bear the additional burden of being deprived of the opportunity of an education, a job, or simple justice. Tremendous thanks to Tony Clark and the folks here at the Carter Library for all they have done to make this evening possible. It's so fortunate that our missions have crossed paths in this way. Thanks to Lauren Kemp at Acapella Books, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Atlanta Press Club, and the James Weldon Johnson Institute at Emory University for helping bring us all here tonight. I should also acknowledge a few who are here joining us from Dayton, Ohio. Sharon Rabb, the founder of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Um, Tom Lasley, a former and longtime board member of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation. And Ray Blattner, a current trustee of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation. 
Additionally, a gentleman that you are all familiar with, I'm sure, the most recently retired editor-in-chief of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Kevin Riley. Kevin, thanks so much for opening the doors uh, to make this all possible. There he is over there, yes. Our conversationalist tonight is Mr. Ernie Suggs, a name I'm sure you're all familiar with as well. Ernie has been a reporter at the AJC since 1997, currently covering race and culture, as well as a variety of breaking national news and investigative stories. A veteran of nearly 30 years as a newspaper reporter, he has covered stories ranging from politics to civil rights to higher education. Since 2016, Ernie has managed the AJC's award-winning Black History Month project through AJC, AJC Sepia, the paper's black news curation site. A 1990 graduate of North Carolina Central University with a degree in English literature, Suggs was also a 2009 Harvard University Neiman Fellow, and Ernie is currently on the Neiman Foundation's Board of Trustees and is a former national vice president of the National Association of Black Journalists. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, his obsession for prints, Spike Lee movies, Hamilton, and the New York Yankees is unmatched. And so without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ernie Suggs and the 2023 Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation's winners for nonfiction. His name is George Floyd, Robert Samuels, and Olu Tolu Olurunipa. Thanks so much. You guys have a preference? <laughs> Thank you all for coming out on this traffic ridden night, as every night in Atlanta is traffic ridden. Um, but we're going to go ahead and start. As you know, we have a hard out at 8.15 because we have the State of the Union address tonight. And these two gentlemen you work for the Washington Post and they cover important things and they got work to do. Today. <laughs> so we're going to start. Um, May 25th will mark the fourth anniversary of the death of George Floyd, who as a child and in his journals wrote that one day he wished to become a Supreme Court justice. Sadly, it was not the li his life, but his murder by police officer Derek Chauvin that touched off a wave of massive protests for racial justice and sparked an ongoing national conversation about race in America and here in Atlanta, as you all remember. <clears throat> While much is known about George Floyd's death, our guests are our friends here in Atlanta. <laughs> Washington Post reporter Robert Samuels and Tolu Olonorip, Olo, Olo, Oh, I'm going to say it. Olo Renipa <laughs> believe we can learn a lot by looking at his life. Their new book, as you know, as you hopefully you all have a copy of it. Um, their new book examines George's Ford, Floyd's 46 years, uh, um, 46 years in detail, drawn on hundreds of interviews and a trove of public records. And the interviews are amazing. The work that you guys did is amazing on this. Uh, the book is a portrait of a black man raised in poverty who the authors argue found his opportunities and aspirations limited to at every turn by the legacy of slavery and ongoing institutional racism. Um, and as mentioned, Robert is, a, um, Robert is a national enterprise reporter at The Post. Tolu is a uh, political enterprise reporter and White House correspondent, chief of the White House, right? Yeah. So um, we're going to get into a really, really good conversation. But first, you know, do you guys, this Dayton Literary Peace Prize, I want to just briefly talk about just your thoughts about, you know, winning such a prestigious honor and what does that mean for your career? And they won Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, th <laughs> thank you so much. I, I just want to start off by saying that we're really honored and grateful to be here. Um, a lot of the things that we wrote about in writing this book had to do with the themes that Jimmy Carter uh, devoted his life to, advancement, peace, uh, progress for the country. Um, and so we were honored to win the Dayton Literary Peace Prize because it's not too often that you think of journalism or a book or literature in association with peace and promoting peace. But it was quite an honor to know that the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, which has as its tradition the effort to make sure that when we were reading, when we were using the written word, when we were consuming literature, that we were thinking about other 
people's perspectives. And that is a prerequisite for peace. You have to understand where other people are coming from. That's what we tried to do in writing about George Floyd's life, writing about his life as an American story, not just a tragedy, but a, a story that could tell us more about who we are as Americans, more about where we've come from and where we should be going going forward. So we were honored to uh, see our work, see this book associated with the concept of peace. And it's our honor to be here at the, uh, at the Carter Center because we know that's something that Jimmy Carter devoted himself to as well. Uh, we can go to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this started out, I'm sorry. Uh, this started out as a series in the Washington Post. Um, you know, all of us were writing about this. Why did you decide that you wanted to go so deeply into his life to develop it into a book? Uh, we, the origin story of this book is, is, is um, something that we, we talk about from time to time because both Robert and I were um, covering politics in different ways in 2020 when George Floyd was murdered. Uh, I was covering the Trump White House, covering the presidential election, covering the day in and day out chaos that uh, that was happening at the White House. Robert was writing these sweeping, important stories about who you are as a country uh, and how the country was grappling with these major issues. And, and we both were reluctant to cover the breaking news story of another black man being killed by police. We had done this before. We had both covered a number of different racial protests from the aftermath of Trayvon Martin's death to Michael Brown and Ferguson. And we sort of knew there was a cadence for how these things happen. There was a cadence for how journalists cover these things. We sweep into a community, we cover the protests, we get some quotes from people who are angry, and then after a while we leave, and not much changes. And so we were reluctant to, um, to do that. It was the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we had our own you know, trauma to consider as well. And so what piqued our interest was the idea that the Washington Post was going to approach George Floyd's death differently. We saw that the country was re reacting differently. We saw that it seemed to be a moment that was different from what we had seen in the past. And what the Post did was was tell us that we weren't going to do, you know, sort of your traditional profile of George Floyd. Um, we were going to go deeper and tell the story not only of George Floyd, but also the story of America. And we were going to examine systemic racism and put it under the spotlight. And so the result was a six part series that looked at uh, systemic racism through the lens of George Floyd's life, examining things like the criminal justice system, the housing system, the healthcare system, the education system, how policing works in the country. Uh, and we were able to go very deep. Uh, and so that is the origin story of this book because once we did that, we realized there was an appetite in the country for understanding our history, for understanding where we had come from, understanding why the country was so riven by George Floyd's death and why it led to such major protests. And so we did that series and it really consumed us, it really inspired us, it made us understand that there was more to do to try to advance the cause for racial justice. And we thought that one thing that we could do was get people to know the person who they were taking to the streets for, get them to know who he was as a person, not just an icon, not just a symbol, but an actual person who had a history, who had a story, who had hopes and dreams, who had flaws. And we uh, really got to know George Floyd over the course of doing the series and uh, were able to build on that in, in, in writing a book about his life and, and writing a book about the America that he came to know. Yeah, and I know some of you are probably wondering how we were able to do that. The person that we were writing about was not there for us to interview him or to spend time with him. Well, uh, we sp spoke to all of his siblings. We got in touch with all of them who participated in the book. Uh, we spoke to people who knew him intimately, his friends, his, <laughs> his extended family, the girl who told us that she was the only woman George Floyd ever loved, the other woman who told us that she was the only woman George Floyd ever loved, the <laughs> third woman who told us she was the only woman George <laughs> Floyd ever loved. And then we went further, we spoke to lots of experts who look at the idea of systemic racism because we didn't, we knew that when the conversation about George Floyd was happening that people had a lot of interest in what this thing was. And it was one thing to talk about it 
in a sort of <laughs> academic sense, but it was another thing to help people understand that if you look at the life of this man whose name that we all knew, that you could begin to understand how some of the policies that existed in this country long ago, uh, some way before George Floyd was born and some that were enacted after George Floyd was born, shaped his life. Uh, so we spoke to people who understood that part of it, and they had a few hypotheses about why George Floyd would might do some of the things he did. And in a lot of cases, they were onto something. And then we spoke to uh, people in office, lawmakers, uh, the civil rights leaders, and the very last phone call that we got, literally a half hour before we were supposed to turn the book in, was from President Joe Biden, who also participated. So that was able to, so that's how we were able to do that. And in addition, the thing that we did was we tried to spend a lot of time in the communities that George, where George Floyd lived. So uh, we spent a lot of time in Houston, we spent a lot of time in Minneapolis, uh, we went to church where he went to church. Uh, his barber became my barber. And we tried to do as much as we could to understand this life, not simply because we thought there was value in understanding who George Floyd was. And there is innate value in being able to humanize someone whose face gets reduced to only their face. But the larger challenge was that if we helped people understand George Floyd's story as a fundamentally American story, then we can begin to have conversations in this country about who we are as American people and to start looking at some of these institutions in ways that can be insidious and in ways that cannot be insurmountable. I think it was fascinating in reading the book how you use George Floyd as an avatar for the social, cultural, political, economic ills that black men and black people have had for centuries. And I, I want to lead into this question about the fact that he died, you know, he spent his whole life poor, um, in, you know, in trouble with the law, uh, on drugs, you know, battling addiction. But his great, great grandfather, is, I think it was his great-great-grandfather, was rich. And he was never able to pass any of that down. Can you talk about just how, t tell that story about his great-great-grandfather and how that, build upon, that builds upon where we are or where George Floyd ended up as a black man and where we are as a country as black people? Yeah, like, like Robert said, we, we spoke to hundreds of people who knew George Floyd as we were trying to understand his motivations, his soul, his background, his inspirations. Um, but we also wanted to answer questions that were fundamental to how he came into the world. Like you said, he lived his life in extreme poverty from the moment he was born, essentially until he died. Um, and we were trying to understand the question, how did George Floyd come into the world poor? What happened before he came into the world that sort of set his life on a certain path? And so we did a lot of genealogical research talking to the family, getting the oral history, but also looking through the archives. And we found that George Floyd's family had been in this country for generations, had worked hard every generation. And despite being victims of the brutality of slavery, had worked hard, had been industrious. And in the late 1800s, after the Civil War, they had started to amass wealth in North Carolina, working as farmers, working with their large family. Um, and by the time George Floyd's great-great-grandfather um, was entering the, 20, the 20th century, he owned 500 acres of land in North Carolina. He was one of the wealthiest black men in Eastern North Carolina, built solely off of the hard work and, and industriousness of his family. And as we researched his life, as we researched uh, his experience, we wanted to understand what happened. And so we talked to his descendants, we looked at newspaper clippings, we looked at gene genealogical documents uh, dating back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, and we found that he had all of his wealth stripped away. He was born enslaved and worked hard after getting his freedom, but despite the fact that he had worked so hard, there were people in his community 
uh, who didn't like the fact that he was wealthy, that he was a wealthy black man, that he was increasing in wealth even as um, people thought that he was not equipped to excel because of the color of his skin. And so because he was never given an opportunity to read, it was actually illegal for him to learn to read uh, during the time that he was enslaved. He was essentially duped out of his land. Uh, he had his land stolen from him through fraudulent tax uh, auctions and fraudulent business deals. And he died poor uh, as an 80-year-old man who was unable to give any of his immense wealth to any of his descendants. And that was in line with what was happening in the country writ large, especially here in the South, where uh, wealthy black landowners were being stripped of their land um, through often fraudulent means. And we documented that over the course of about 60 years, from the late 1800s to the uh, Jim Crow, uh, to the Civil Rights era, uh, during this period of Jim Crow retaliation for, for some black success, um, farmers especially were uh, targeted. And so more than 90% of the land that was owned by black farmers in the late 1800s, by the time you get to the middle of the 20th century, had been stripped away, had been sold away, was no longer under black ownership. And George Floyd's family history exemplifies that transfer of wealth, that transfer of land. And so by the time George Floyd's grandparents come into the world, they are born poor, they have to work as sharecroppers, they work hard over the course of their life, but they're never ever to own, and never able to own anything for themselves. And one of the things that was <coughs> surprising and fascinating for us was learning that not only were George Floyd's grandparents sharecroppers, but his mother as a child worked as a sharecropper. And so you think about the legacy of slavery, you think about the legacy of these things that happened so long ago, and it's very easy to draw a line from the tobacco fields of North Carolina of the mid 1800s to George Floyd coming into the world 120 years later and still suffering from the legacy of that taking of that violence, of that oppression. And so one of the main things we wanted to do in telling his story was to dispel this notion that, you know, slavery was such a long time ago, everyone should get over it. It has no impact on, on today. We found very clearly that it had an impact on George Floyd's life. And um, the last thing I'll say is that we also were able to do research on the family that owned George Floyd's ancestors. And we saw how they were able to amass wealth and hold on to that wealth and pass that wealth down and build that generational wealth and had a different life story uh, in their family line than George Floyd had in his family line. And it's very clearly uh, a result of the kind of racial oppression that we have seen in the past, but continues to have reverberations today. Robert. Uh, the first words of the book are, I love you. Why, why that? And tell us who George Floyd is. Sure. Well. George Floyd, we say, he was a godly man. The first time I went to his apartment, or when I saw his room in his townhome, there was a Bible there that was open to the book of Proverbs. He was reading it. He knew his, he knew his word. Um, he was a gregarious man. Uh, people who knew him, when they talked about him, and you'd say, tell me a story about your time with Floyd, uh, their eyes would light up and they tell stories about the antics he'd play on the football field. Uh, they talked about the times that he would try to break up fights within his community, it's something he was known to do. Uh, he was a complicated man. And when we say he was a complicated man, it was he was a person who had believed from a very young age, he would say, one day I'm going to do something to touch the world. I don't want to rule the world, I don't want to own the world, I just want to touch it. And he had all these ambitions and a sort of sense of internal do-how. One of the interviews that we did was with his second grade teacher, and this story is in the book, but it turns out at the end of second grade, he was reading and writing on grade level, which if you're growing up in the type of poverty that George Floyd was growing up into, is a pretty big accomplishment. Uh, by the time he grows up, he has this idea that he wants to be a Supreme Court justice because he had learned about Thurgood Marshall and he thought it was the greatest thing to be able to adjudicate the law. Uh, but they saw a man who was big 
and black and fast. And people quickly told him that, you know, people in our neighborhood, they don't become lawyers. If you want your way out, you have to play sports. That wasn't a theoretical thing. Where he was from in the third ward in Houston had produced a number of professional pro athletes. Um, but that didn't work out for him. And he wasn't able to play in college when he couldn't meet the academic requirements after a lifetime of tolding, being told he shouldn't focus on academics. And so you start to see the cruel compounding of some of the, these themes, <coughs> these things that we talk about playing into his life, having him sort of figure out, what am I going to do? How am I going to make money? Uh, a lot of times that meant giving in to the economics of his neighborhood and the economics of the neighborhood which was drugs, and then thinking about how am I supposed to cope with this idea that I had all these big dreams and this is what I ended up doing. And a lot of times he gave into the coping mechanism of his neighborhood, which was also drugs. And so by the time George Floyd gets to Minneapolis, he goes more than a thousand miles away because he's heard that there's a place in the north that some of his friends have gone to where people who have his problems have the chance to restart their lives and get clean. And that's the type of person who ultimately encounters Derek Chauvin. So I think now there's been a lot of a proliferation of a lot of misinformation about who George Floyd was. One thing that was clear within our research and within the stories that were told and are reflected in the pages of what we had written was a man who was incredibly persistent, a man who was nonviolent, and also a man who never gave up on the idea of the American dream. That, that was the summation of George Floyd. I want to get into his existence in, in Minneapolis in a second, but I want to touch on one thing um, about things that we were probably surprised to learn about George Floyd, is that he was very introspective. Yeah. He wrote journals. He was very conscious of his size as a tall, big black man. Talk about just that introspectiveness and the consciousness of who he was living within his body. Well, uh, one of the questions that we had was, you know, how do you channel the voice of a person uh, that you haven't met? And it turned out that George Floyd, throughout the course of his life, he had written raps and diary entries to himself about how he was feeling and his condition. Now, one thing about George Floyd, who was 6'6", 250 pounds, had a 100-pound bicep curl, strong guy, uh, was that he had built up his body because he had wanted to be an athlete. So George Floyd was naturally very lanky. But because he wanted to play football, they told him, you need to bulk up. So he did. And uh, on the field, he was known, uh, his coach would often say, be more ruthless. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if someone bigger than George Floyd was coming toward him, he'd just give the ball to him. He didn't want to get into fights, right? Um, and so that was a part of it. But another thing that was told to us was that if he were to walk into a room like this today with a bunch of people that he didn't know, he would walk, want to walk and greet everyone and you know, introduce himself so people would know that he wasn't an intimidating person because he understood that uh, when his body was not on a field, he was a six foot six muscular black man. And he had to live with that duality that uh, there was a pride in it and there was also a threat that came with seeming so threatening. One of the reasons that we had started the book with the words, I love you, is that I made a joke earlier about the women who had loved him, but the first time I heard someone say this, they said, George Floyd told me he loved me. And I thought, this man's got game. But then when <coughs> you spoke to anyone about the last thing they remembered George Floyd saying to them, it was, I love you. And he would say that because he knew that as black men, People don't know they often give people their flowers, right? So he wanted to make sure that he had spread some love in the world before he left. 
Now, I think it's one of those cruel ironies, right, that the three words that we most associate with George Floyd today are, I can't breathe. But if you spoke to people who knew him, the three words they would associate most with George Floyd would be, I love you. You talked about, and I'll get Tolu um, to answer this, you talked about um, his decision to move to Minneapolis. He had already been in prison in Houston, right? So Minneapolis was going to be a new start. What was his existence like in Minneapolis? I, I can answer that by first talking about what, it, what led him to leave um, yeah. Texas. Um, and one of the reasons he left Texas was because he wanted to leave sort of the, the trauma of his past. He, was, he had been incarcerated. Um, he had been... Um, in some ways traumatized by the carceral system uh, in, in Texas that was very harsh uh, and very disproportionate. Um, a lot of the times he was locked up, we went through all of his arrest records to get a sense of this and talk to the people who were with him in his 20s and early 30s as he was cycling in and out of jail. And you know, a lot of times he, he had to take a plea deal for petty offenses like possession or tras trespassing or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and this was just sort of the, the nature of the, the war on drugs and the war on crime in the, in the late 80s and early 90s where, um, you know, someone like George Floyd is going to stick out and is going to get arrested over and over and isn't going to be able to afford a lawyer and is going to take a plea deal. And so a lot of the things on his rap sheet were minor offenses that he pled to um, just so uh, he could... <laughs> do his time and come home. And, but after he had done that and had a lengthy rap sheet in, in a state like Texas, it can be very difficult to uh, get on the right path because there is a lot of discrimination against people that have records and it's official discrimination, not even, not even um, sort of behind, scene, behind the scenes discrimination. He couldn't get a license to be a barber or to be a plumber or to be a real estate agent because of his, his record. And so he realized that there wasn't much of a financial future for him and trying to do things the right way in Texas. And so he decided, like Robert said, to, uh, to, to, to chase a future in a place that seemed a little bit more forgiving, seemed like it would be more open armed to someone like him, had an opportunity for him to get health care through Medicaid expansion, and had an opportunity for him to get treatment for what by that time was a pretty serious addiction issue. Um, and so he leaves Texas. Um, and in the early months of his time in Minneapolis, things are actually going very well for him. He is happy that he's made this choice. He's getting, he's gotten treatment, he's getting clean. Uh, not only did he get treatment, but he got treatment at a rehab center that was specifically tailored to people like him, to black men who were dealing with the struggles that he was dealing with. And so he had gotten treatment, he was dating, he was working, he was making money. He was having the veneer of the American dream. Um, and so what happens to him in, in Minneapolis is that he, he gets a taste of, of that and he gets to see sort of what it's like to breathe for a little bit and, and have a little bit of uh, hope. And then things start to spiral. Um, he realizes that he can't run from uh, the trauma that people like him experience no matter where they are in the country. And so one of the first dominoes that starts to fall is that his, his roommate at the time, someone who was also going through treatment and other big black man or athletic, former athlete like him, um, who had been dealing with some addiction issues but had gotten treatment. Um, George Floyd comes home and sees his friend, whose name was Big E, um, passed out. And he, George Floyd is the person who discovers that his friend has over overdosed and died. And that sends him into a, a really tough place because he realizes that if someone like his friend who is dealing with the same issues, who had seemed like he was doing well, who had gone through treatment, who was clean, had, had succumbed to his addiction in this way, what hope was there for, for Floyd? Um, and shortly after that, he gets the news that his mother has passed away back in Houston. Um, and we get into this in the book, but George Floyd and his mother were incredibly close, and people who, who have seen the video of him dying hear him crying out for his mother, who had passed uh, a couple, you know, a couple of years earlier, and so they had an incredibly <coughs> close relationship. And so, she dies while he's trying to get himself together, and that sends him further, further down. Um, and then the final blow is that 
the COVID pandemic hits, and it doesn't only hit, but it hits people like George Floyd especially hard. Um, the places where he was working or places where you couldn't work remote, you had to be in person, and those places shut down, places like nightclubs and security guard, security guard work uh, where he was working. Um, they shut down, he was sent home, and uh, whatever stimulus checks that he was able to get were not able to really go very far. And so by the time he meets Derek Chauvin, he is really, really struggling, um, and he's really in a, in a dark place, despite the fact that Minneapolis had been a beacon of hope for him. Um, one of the things that we were able to, to, to discover was that a lot of times places that seem like they are incredibly progressive and incredibly open still suffer from a lot of the, the, the vestiges of institutional racism and still have to deal with those things um, in the way that people actually experience life in these places. And George Floyd experienced the hope that Minneapolis offered, but also um, how that hope could, could slip away so quickly. Um, and so by the time he met Derek Chauvin, um, he was sort of suffering from the, the, the trials and tribulations that come along with being a black man, no matter where you are in the country, whether you're in the South and somewhere like Texas or you're up North and somewhere like Minneapolis. Before we get into Derek Chauvin, I know that you know, the, the data sh shows that black men don't seek therapy. You know, even guys like us who've gone to college and have jobs and have insurance, you know, we just, it's just something we don't do. Losing um, Big E, then losing his father, then uh, losing, I'm sorry, losing his mother, then the COVID crisis comes. Did he have any kind of help? Did he have any kind of opportunities to seek any kind of help? Or he was just lost out there by himself? Well, yeah, I mean, he came to Minneapolis to seek therapy. And uh, just because of the nature of the people who are with him, he had a support system in some senses of people who are trying to help lift one another up. So he didn't come to Minneapolis alone. When he came, there was sort of a, you know, there was a path, a passage from Houston to Minneapolis of people who are going through the same thing and people who had been successful with it. I think one of the differences is that when that's your support system and everyone's sort of in the same place, everyone is trying to figure out their own schedule and their own lives. And it's hard to maintain that uh, synchronicity as you continue to go, as you continue to live your life, right? And then I think you also, we also have to consider the, uh, just the presence of threat, right? Uh, what we had found out was when we were looking at things like opioids. So what happened, you guys know songs about lean and scissorp and all of that. So all of that, that music had started in Texas in George Floyd's neighborhood. And uh, that was the path to going from uh, codeine to, in some cases, heroin to fentanyl, to uh, oxycodone and Percocet, which is what was done in Minneapolis. And three weeks after George Floyd died, uh, the state of Minneapolis put out a special report saying, we've been very concerned about the opioid crisis, and we've actually been looking at it in all the wrong places, because all the money has been going here and the biggest problems are over here. And over here is where George Floyd was, right? And so you have this constant tug of, you know, I, uh, we're speaking of State of the Union, but Hunter Biden has, you know, talked to talk frankly about the fact that um, drug dependency is an hourly, it's an hourly struggle, right? So, um, you have a person in a community where this is not being treated, not being treated in the same way. And then you have a pandemic that isolates those sorts of people. And that's the conundrum that George Floyd found himself in. What, the, what our reporting showed was that in late 2019, uh, he had run into one of the people at the treatment center and his plan was to go back into treatment. But COVID had complicated that matter. You guys are not shy about 
detailing his missteps, his arrest, his opioid addiction, his time in prison. And you interviewed 400 people for this book, including his family. So how were you able to kind of navigate these questions with his family? Because I know as a reporter, it's difficult often to talk to family members of someone who's died, especially someone who's high profile as him. Uh, when you were writing this book, Chauvin hadn't been convicted yet or hadn't gone to trial yet. So how difficult was it to break the family? Or not break, but you know, get into the family. <laughs> um, you handle it honestly, uh, because that's what you do. Now, when we spoke to the Floyd family, you know, as I would do with any other person who I'm speaking with, I make sure they know their rights, which is their right to tell me, buzz off, and I don't want to answer this question, mm -hmm. and that's okay, you know. Um, and, you know, the first time that we had asked about this, they essentially told me, buzz off, and we kept on moving, <clears throat> right? Um, but the, tru the, the truth of the matter is also this, that there are people in his life because of what they had gone through and because they had known George Floyd's openness about his struggles, they were willing to talk about it in extraordinary detail and we're thankful to them for it because they understood that the larger thing was not to demonize George Floyd, it was to humanize George Floyd, but also to help show those of us who still have the privilege of living some of the issues so we can continue to live better lives, right? That's what this was all about. And I think one of the most important testimonies came from his girlfriend, Courtney Ross, uh, who was a white woman and had fallen into the throes of drug dependency with George Floyd. And in the pages, uh, she talks about what that was like to go through together, but also her treatment by larger society, even when she had the same issues because she was in the same house doing the same drugs. And so you had a situation where she was able to find jobs, police never stopped her, even though there are times when they'd see pills on her dashboard. And she had to work through that, right? And so, you know, there's this larger conversation about drugs in this country that we need to have. But I think it's impossible to ignore the truth of the matter, which was that when <coughs> we discuss opioid use in suburban environments, it's a very sympathetic thing. When Courtney Ross got on the stand and told her story about her struggle with drug dependency, she got lots of text messages of people inviting her to their house mm -hmm. and encouragement. And I know this because I was there when she was getting the text messages. I was right next to her. Mm -hmm. And what we, we can compare that to the ways that uh, people with more nefarious intent try to use George Floyd's story, not just to diminish his life as if it didn't matter, but also to diminish the fact that what his death had resurrected within this country was a heightened awareness and a necessary conversation about race. There was a narrative that was going around <clears throat> that was quickly debunked that George knew Chauvin that they knew each other. But let's talk a little bit about that night and the collision course that, that they met, unfortunately, that night. Can you talk a little bit about what, and the, and the first chapter of the book is amazing. I told you guys it reads like a novel, and you kind of lead up to right before that. But talk about that night and just what that day was like, because he was just hanging out. He was just going shopping, basically. Yeah, Memorial Day uh, 2020 was a normal day for George Floyd, other than the fact that he was sort of out of work and um, struggling because of the, the pandemic. He wanted to have a normal day. He wanted to have a Memorial Day barbecue. He was running errands with a friend. He was uh, at the corner store um, just spending the day thinking it was going to be a normal day. And so you talk about the collision course. We also were included a chapter in the book about Derek Chauvin and his life arc and the life arc of his entire family um, going back several generations. But the, the pathway that took Derek Chauvin to that corner um, also tells us about the country. It also tells us about America. It tells us about how policing works. Um, you know, Derek Chauvin was a 
thumper in the words of uh, both his colleagues and people in the community who had dealt with him. Uh, he was a, an incredibly aggressive police officer who had a history of complaints, um, but he was also representative. Um, he wasn't an outlier in terms of the kinds of policing that he performed in the community where he was performing it. He was known as someone who would put people in a chokehold. He had done it multiple times before he met George Floyd, it had been complained about multiple times and he had not been reprimanded, but instead had been promoted and had been encouraged. And so the pathway that he was on was that the community, his professional um, environment was encouraging him to do what he was doing, was encouraging him to police the way he policed that day. And George Floyd was sort of the, the, the next person in the long line of people who he had treated in a specific way without a lot of fanfare, without protests, without, um, in many cases, without, a, without the person dying. But I think it's important for us to in, it, put the spotlight on George Floyd and, and how his, his life led him to that moment in May 25th, 2020, but also look at Derek Chauvin and look at the systems that led him to that moment, the systems that encouraged him to police the way that he did and that did not stop him uh, even when there were multiple red, flashing red flags uh, and warning signs in his life uh, and in his policing career years and months before he met uh, George Floyd. And it tells us about policing in America and specifically in the third precinct of Minneapolis. And it tells us about what we encourage and what we support and who in our society gets support when they make bad choices. And if, as, a, as a quick aside, you know, Derek Chauvin was later convicted of tax fraud um, because he had been working off the books as a police officer for years without um, a lot of um, scrutiny. And George Floyd gets arrested for allegedly using a $20 counterfeit bill and is killed for it. And so it's a, a stark reminder of um, who gets grace in our country, who gets the force of law targeted uh, at them, and, and what that means for, for, for what we need to do going forward to bring more um, equality and justice into our system. So Robert, going back to the $20 bill. So he goes, he's Memorial Day, he wants to have a cookout, he's going to buy some charcoal, he goes into the store and he's allegedly has used a twenty dollar bill or a counterfeit twenty dollar bill. You pick it up from if uh, uh, yeah. from from when he uses the twenty dollar bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he's there with he's there with two of his friends, uh, one friend who he's been running around town with, and uh, a former lover of his named Shawanda Hill, and. Uh, he uh, comes out, uh, there's a person at the register who says, looks at the hue of the bill and believes it's counterfeit. Uh, because George Floyd is well known at the store, the manager says, you should go out and tell him so he can come back in. George Floyd, who's been running around all day, uh, is uh, chatting with his friends, uh, one of whom is, who is very jumpy because he's a drug dealer and uh, is falling asleep because he's very tired. Uh, he's confronted uh, by the, well, he's not confronted. The person at the register who's a teenager approaches him after calling uh, and says, this is counterfeit, George Floyd says. I don't know what you're talking about. No one in the car knows what he's talking about. And uh, the boy walks into the store and he's told to call the police, which he does. And uh, when uh, someone in the car says, you need to go and give this guy $20 because it looks like he's about to call the police. Um, that's the part of this story that picks up that we all know. I didn't really feel like we need to go through great detail what happened. There are some things that I would want to point out um, just about the reporting of it, because um, one, because I want you all to pick up the book, but I also think it's, this is the part that never made it to a witness stand or had never been told before, uh, because it was said, which was wrong, that George Floyd had gone to that store to uh, pay a cell phone bill. Mm -hmm. 
and that didn't square with me. And so we tried to find the two people who were in the car with him. Now, uh, Maurice, Hill, Mar Maurice Hall uh, had pleaded the fifth on the stand. Uh, Shawanda Hill um, was essentially a, deemed a hostile witness. And so no one had talked to them before. Uh, and, but I had a friend, which is why it's good in life to be close to your friends, uh, who had taken a picture of Shawanda. And I called and asked if she had any contact information for her. And uh, my friend said, I don't, but I kind of remember where she lives. So how about I fly to Minneapolis and we can look for the apartment together? And we go and we find it. And there are all these buttons on the outside with no names and no numbers. And I said, well, <laughs> you can start on the top and I'll start on the bottom and we'll knock on every door of the apartment until we find the right person. But let's just see if someone opens the door. And at that point, I pushed the door just to see if it was unlocked and it was unlocked. And I, uh, we walked in and we heard a voice from the basement say, who are you looking for? And I said, uh, I'm looking for Shawanda. And he goes, Shawanda, you mean the woman who lives in? And then he just gave us the apartment number. And he said, yeah, that's her. He didn't say woman. He used another word. And um, we got there, and we knocked on the door. And I explained what we were doing and she said you guys are writing about you guys are writing a book about Floyd and I said yes thinking that you know she was going to tell me to buzz off um, but instead she looked and she said then I need to be in it I need to be a part of it and we came in and you know her it was a studio apartment with a queen bed and a chair, and I sat on the chair, and she sat on the bed, and she began to tell us this story. And I mentioned this um, because I think sometimes, you know, we've trafficked through a lot of really hard truths about this. And I think sometimes there's this instinct that, you know, maybe we shouldn't talk about it. Maybe it feels a little exploitative. Maybe it seems a little bit harsh. But for those people who had known George Floyd and had that segment of the truth that was obscured from the public, there was something really valuable to them about that. Not just so we could traffic in all the terrible stuff, but to remind people of the person that they had loved and also to help people try to attain a better sense of the country for people who are still around. With all the work you did, with all the interviews you did, and all the research and data, just digging into his life as no, no one has ever done before, did you end up liking him? Or what did you like about him? So the official answer is that we're journalists, and so when we're writing about a subject, we're supposed to be neutral. Um, but the off-the-record answer is that, yes, we, we came to admire things about George Floyd, his perseverance, the way he impacted people, the way he picked himself up when he when he made mistakes or when the system was harsh toward him, um, and the fact that he left a, a legacy of not just being an icon and, and people chanting his name, but the people who knew him feeling so strongly about him, remembering scenes from their years in high school um, so vividly, the fact that he had left such an impression, like Robert said, the fact that he would go around saying, I love you, to everyone, men, women, children, strangers on the street. Um, and so we found a lot to admire about him, even as we trained a neutral, I don't want to say neutral, but a journalistic eye on his life. And we didn't shy away from his, his, his hard times, his own mistakes, his own introspection about those mistakes. Um, I think one of the things we wanted to make sure came through in the book was his spirit, the spirit of his family, the spirit of perseverance, the spirit of the black community at large, um, that has every reason to sort of give up on this country and say, you know, this is not fair and there's no reason to believe in the American dream, but continues to 
have that level of faith, that, that level of perseverance to really uphold the American spirit in a way that um, really is exemplary. I thought that shined through as we learned more about George Floyd, as we learned about his family and his family history and his community. Um, I thought there was a lot to, to admire. And even as the book deals with some of the hard parts of the American story, I think one of the inspirational parts of that story comes from communities like George Floyd's community that is so resilient, is so willing to pick itself up after um, experiencing trauma and continues to believe that this country will uphold its promise. Um, and so I found a lot of inspiration in that. What about you, Robert? I really liked him. And uh, I'm not, I'm not shy about saying it because I fear that, you know, if I had walked down the street and saw George Floyd, <coughs> that I might have dismissed him, that I might have looked at him and thought things about him without having the opportunity of learning the depth and the wit and the humor that was noticeable to so many people who knew him. Uh, one of the poems that he had written that I think about a lot was when he's really having a tough time and um, it's in the middle of the pandemic. It's probably one of the last things he had written to himself, just given the timing of it. Um, and he, you know, he says, uh, you know, life's really hard. I'm stuck with Corona, COVID, and I only have a hundred bucks to my name. I have this addiction and I'm looking at the sun and life really sucks, but life never sucks, right? Like to himself, like that's what he's telling himself. And you just think about how many times that in our daily lives you think to yourself, man, this really sucks, but I can't let it get to me, right? And how can you not learn to appreciate and be endeared by a person who continues to have that attitude. And, um, you know, that same sort of grace that is given to the people who we report about, um, who do super well and maybe lose their job or are mad because the government did this and that to them. And even though they're complaining, we're still able to see them through the clear eyes of them having a fundamentally American dream. That was the thing that George Floyd was displaying to us through the work that, through his own work, through the things that he had written to himself, through the stories he was telling people. I mean, one of the interesting stories that come up, you know, toward the end of the book is one of his lovers starts to tell him that she had recently lost a boy that she had considered her son, right? And not only did the son die prematurely, it was another family member that had murdered him. And now the family wanted to seek retribution. And uh, George Floyd tells her what to say to the family, to say that God wouldn't want a family to hurt twice, that violence is not the answer, all of that. you know. I think that's being a good boyfriend. But here's the thing about it, Ernie. When I was telling people that story, before I could get to what George Floyd said, everybody who I told that story to said, and Floyd did something to try and break up the fight. Because that was the type of person he was. You know, so yeah, I like I'll mess with a guy like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mentioned early on, and I think we have about 13 minutes left. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that May 25th is the anniversary. When you guys started this project, George Floyd's name was the third most tweeted or Googled name in the, in the world, right? In the world, behind uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And his, you know, four years later, George Floyd's still there. He's still spoken of every day. He's still in the political zeitgeist. 
why has his story resonated so much and how, yeah, how, why has his story resonated so much four years later? And why is it still, why is he still so important? I think you have to go back to uh, four years ago and, and remember where the country was. We were in the middle of a pandemic. We were suffering through um, a time where everyone had to be at home and couldn't look away and couldn't be distracted by all of the things that distract us and make the news cycle move so quickly. And, and when George Floyd died, it was this collective moment, the, the rare kind of collective moment that we, we, we rarely get these days in this sort of fragmented media environment. And we all had to had to watch someone um, dying, but not not only dying, but um, sort of losing his life in such a tragic way. People saw an agent of the state with their knee literally on the neck of a black man who was crying out for mercy, saying, "I can't breathe." And there was something symbolic about that. There was something definitive about that. That. Um, even in other cases where, where people are killed by police, there can be a lot of debate over, you know, was that a justified use of force? This was a split second decision. Was the officer in fear for his life? I think because it was so clear and because we all had to watch it, I think it led, it left this indelible mark on our culture. And so one of George Floyd's legacy is, legacies is that change that has sort of reverberated across several years. Um, and it's also, as we have seen over and over again in this larger generation's long struggle for racial justice, there is an inevitable backlash. And so also part of George Floyd's legacy is the backlash to that push for racial justice that we saw relatively quickly after um, people gathered together and marched and said that, you know, we were going to change things. We saw people trying to take advantage of some of the angst in the country and push back against that and that pushback is also part of the story. And so we are now living through the process of what do we do with this legacy? Where, does, where do we go as a country? We're in the middle of an, another election year. And so I think one of the reasons his name has continued to reverberate is because what we tried to do in the book was tell his story as an American story. And I think the way he, he died was in a uniquely American tragedy. Um, and so it's something that we're all grappling with and it's something that struck a chord with so many people and even this many years on, so many of us are grappling with what should we do about it? What should we do to bring the country towards a more equitable future? Um, and the answers are not easy. We didn't put like a, a, a list of answers at the back of the book, so sorry for anyone who, who wants that. Um, but it's a highly, highly contextualized, highly complex, um, issue, and because we're still grappling with it, I think that's one of the reasons why people point back to this moment that we all remember as a moment where we at least felt something, we felt like something needed to change, and recapturing that and doing something with it is difficult, and it's difficult to, to, to recreate those kinds of moments, and we haven't seen an, uh, another moment like it since, even though more, more people have been killed by police, more people have struggled, we've seen more injustices, but the fact that we haven't seen another galvanizing moment like that since over the last four years, I think that's another reason why people point back to um, the last time this happened. Robert, um, I forgot my, what my question was going to be. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> after George Floyd was killed um, and after the protest, there was all these promises, political promises, uh, all these DE&I programs starting that had to be, you know, rolled back. So has his passing changed anything? You know, I know his family is a little bit disappointed with, you know, some of the things that never came up about. So has anything changed? Yeah, well, I think it's really hard to, for us to think about the things that have changed within the moment, right? And we shouldn't forget that things have changed. There have been pretty significant changes, right? 16 states uh, banning no-knock warrants and chokeholds, largely because of what happened in 2020, 20, in 2020 is a huge change. Uh, the fact that we see s some, you know, the fact that Aunt Jemima uh, pancake syrup doesn't look the same, or the fact that Splash Mountain at Disney World doesn't look the same, you know, there are, and the fact that we were 
able to have more frank conversations about this issue. Um, all of those things are positive things, right? And I don't think we should discount them. I think it's also important to recognize the reason we can discount them, right? And that the pushback has been so multifaceted and so vociferous that sometimes it's even hard to keep track of just what's going on where. You know, this idea that we would have to deal with book banning in 2024, kind of surprising. Sort of like this move that courts have to step in to tell entire states that, no, you cannot tell a business it is wrong to teach your their employees about racism as a violation of, that's a violation of free speech. It's shocking, you know, and as journalists, it's uniquely horrifying. But as people who live in a country that has benefited from the elements of free speech, it's terrifying. And so I think it's important to recognize why the response is so big, right? And it's because the problems are so big and the solutions are really, really difficult. I think if we could have solved racism in those months between June 2020 and September 2020, we would have solved it, right? But the question is not have things changed, I don't think. I think the question is being able to recognize what has happened and wondering to ourselves, what are we going to do to continue facilitating the change? Because even though we had this weird petri dish of causes that allowed people to fixate on what happened to George Floyd, right? the same people who are in this country today did it, right? And for me, I don't think it's too Pollyanna-ish or too naive to believe that people fundamentally want what's good for them and their communities, right? So the question I don't think should really be have things changed as if we don't have an active role to play in it, we do. All right, the last question, I believe. We have five minutes. Uh, so last question for both of you guys. You can flip a coin as to who's gonna go first. Um, what is his legacy, and what are we gonna be saying about him in 50 years? How do you want him to be remembered? I'll, I'll just kind of pick up where Robert left off in that that is something that is actively being determined today and we all have a role to play in that. I think history books will look back on this moment and ask sort of what we did as a country when we were confronted face to face with the legacy of systemic racism and people rose up and said they wanted to do something about it. Um, and then there was a backlash and people started banning books. We were right in the middle of determining wh which direction we go um, and how that legacy is um, defined for the future. And I don't think it'll just be George Floyd's legacy. I think it'll be the legacy of this country in this moment. Um, and it is TBD in a lot of ways, determining where, which direction we're, we're going to go. We're right there on a knife's edge, and there are a lot of things hanging in the balance, not the least of which is an election that's coming up in several months. But I think there are forces on either side of, side of the equation that are looking at this moment and looking for uh, an advantage. There are forces for justice, there are forces for pushing the country towards um, being more multicultural, being more open, being more equitable. There are also forces that want to capitalize on the fear that some people have about a changing country, about the sense that things are moving too quickly, and they are also looking to capitalize. And I think what George Floyd's legacy will be, what the legacy of this moment will be, is very much something that is actively being determined right now. Um, and I think that the people who, um, who show up, the people who are active, the people who vote, the people who take action are gonna be the ones that write that legacy. Um, and I think it's incumbent on, on all of us, including you know, 
people in our field in the, in the space of journalists in the space of journalism to to look at this moment square in the face and decide what our role is going to be in determining sort of how that history is written and how that history is made um, and I think it's an active debate that's ongoing and so you know I would hope that you know everyone here especially by your presence here uh, there there's a sense that you know you are going to be some of the change makers to determine how this moment is remembered and how George Floyd's legacy, but more importantly, how the legacy of our country is written and established and secured because we, we have seen how quickly uh, progress can be, um, can be undermined. And so not only do we have to fight for that progress, but we have to secure it and we have to defend it and we have to make sure that we are constantly um, activating ourselves to, um, to be part of the process, to be part of the solution. Um, and so I hope that I will be part of that process of, of determining that, that legacy. Um, I hope that by writing the book, I've played some role in that, but I think there is no ability for any of us to rest on our laurels because there is a very active, um, constituency looking to push the country in the opposite direction and move things backwards. And so we all have to be on our guard and we all have to take action to make sure that if we want there to be a legacy for uh, the country in this moment, we have to be playing a role in writing that legacy. Yeah, to summarize it, I often think about, I would say, who is George Floyd? George Floyd was a human being no more human than me no less human than you, who helped show the country both the privilege and the, oppor the privilege and the opportunity that lies in this country. I would say that George Floyd's legacy shows us that the American privilege is its ability to be pessimistic. Right? It's the ability to look at things and walk away and have people deal with the effects of it. But I think the American opportunity is also shown in George Floyd. And that's through the hope that he had when he talked about his life sucking but never sucking. And his belief that even to the very last breaths, that someone would ultimately hear his cry. Please get off of me. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I think if we continue to think about our lives and our connections with each other that way, I think that's a really great way to honor what he meant to this moment and to this country. Well, thank you very much. That's a beautiful way to end it. <clears throat> if, you haven't pick, if you haven't picked out the book, it's a beautiful book. His name is George Floyd. I want uh, you all to give our panel another round of applause. Robert Samuels, Tolu Oromperipri, you know, and listening to them tonight, as Ernie said, their book is, his name is George Floyd. But what it does, it challenges us to ask, who are we? How do we respond to, uh, to what happened? And uh, I think that's the question, as Toulouse was saying. We are continuing to determine the answer to who are we we know who he is and what he was like. Um, we have op, uh, autographed copies of their books. A cappella has them for sale there, and I think especially after tonight, you're going to want to get those as well. Let's thank them, and Ernie as well, one more time. And thank you all very much. <laughs>